and boy, this is your life. I was born on February 24, 1924, in Fürth, Bavaria, the southern part of Germany, to Wilhelm and Christine Eckstein. My parents both worked, so my grandma took care of me during the day. Grandma and Grandpa lived on the edge of town. They had a garden, raised chickens, and had a rooster by the name of Gogli. It, he was my pet. If Grandma had to go somewhere, she told Gogli to watch me. She locked us in the garden, and if I went to, t uh, to, to, to the door, Godly pulled on my dress, and I had to go back with him. He and I went to the store together. He would not let me out of his sight until we got back home. He fought everyone who came near me, unless he knew them. I always loved to be with Grandma and Gogli. On Sunday mornings, Mom used to stick me in the wash tub and gave me a bath, so she would not have to use the bathtub because I was so small. After I started school, Mom and Dad took me skiing and on sleigh rides with them up on the mountain in the winter. Once we got halfway down the mountain on the sleigh when a nail on, on our sleigh came up and hurt Mom's leg. We had to go on down the mountain before we could stop and go to the Red Cross station. I always had to sit between Mom and Dad so I would not get hurt. In the summer, we just went bicycle riding in the mountains and spent the day up there. We all had lots of fun. Once, Mom did send me to the store to get my grandma's medicine. I walked it to the store with one leg up on the sidewalk and the other leg down on the street. When I got to the store, I had lost the money. It fell out of my pocket and I told Mom. She asked me what I did, and I told her the way I walked to the store. She got out her big wooden spoon and came after me. I went under the bed as far as I could, and Mom nailed on the floor, trying to hit me under the bed. I never came out from under the bed until Dad came home from work and helped me. I went to grade school for eight years and started high school when my sister was born. I took care of her after Mom went back to work and everyone was talking about World War II. Every person who was not a full-blooded German had to wear an identification. The Jews had to wear a big yellow star sewed to their clothes. If a Jew owned a store, the SS broke in the windows or burned the store down. They burned their churches and so many just disappeared and no one knew what was happening. Food was so low, we got ration cards. Our family of four got two pounds of potatoes, one pound of meal, half a pound of butter, half a gallon of meal, milk, and a little bread. They say they needed the food and all the things for the military. My mom and I often took turns at the store for horse meat. If you were lucky, you could get half a pound. One day, Mom stood in line at 5 p.m. at the store, and I took her place at 9 p.m. and stood in line until 8 a.m. when the store opened to get half one pound of horse meat. Many times, we made it inside the store after standing outside all night, and the meat was all gone. My sister was very sick when she was three years old and had to have all our food, so we just went hungry so she could have it. It was rough. Then the bombing started. We had to go to bed early at night to get about two hours sleep because after 10 p.m. the planes came in, the sirens went off, and you had to go to the basement. Two hours later, you went back after. All clear sirens flew. Two hours later, back down again to the basement shelter. If you were lucky, back up in about an hour before you had to go to work. Some people never came up, they died. In, day, in daytime, we had mostly only two air raids, but the nights were bad. That went on for years. I do remember one night forever. We all had just gone to bed when the siren started and we could hear the bombs hitting all over town. We got up and rushed to the shelter. We had a dog 
he always hit when the sirens came on. We had to find him to take him down with us. We could never let him out because someone would have killed him and ate him for food. After we were down in the basement for a while, it got still outside. In our hurry, we forgot the milk for my sister and she was crying. My dad said, I go up and get the milk for Gretchen. Something told me to go up, not to let him go. So I told dad I would go for him and for him to stay with mom. We also had an older couple in our shelters because they did not have a good one. Dad said, okay but hurry back down again. I went up the basement steps and on the top, something picked me up and threw me in the air. When I woke up, I saw a little daylight and I ducked myself out. The whole house had come down. They had dropped the bomb on top of it. All the houses in the neighborhood were gone. Some of them were burning. I remembered my family inside, so I tried to find the site the shelter was on. We had marked the chest and case. I went the, to the police station to get help, but no one was there. They were helping others by then. I went to work on my own. I had an understanding in our family that in case something should happen, tried to give a signal from the inside of the shelter by hitting on the wall so you can hear it outside. I did hear the signal and I worked all day to get them out. Two men helped me to get them out. The old couple had died from heart, heart troubles. My mom was uh, shook up and they took her and my sister to the hospital for a checkup. Dad was okay. Dad said mom needed him bad when it did happen, but he was praying for me too. We lost all we had and moved to an apartment at grandma's apartment house. The bombings went on and on, but we were okay. One bomb fell outside the front door of the apartment house, but did not go off. After a day, they came and took it away. I worked for a doctor and went to, high, to night medical school. One day, the doctor had to go into the army. I had the choice to work in a factory where they made bombs or join the military. I joined the Navy and became a communications operator on a boat. We had good food and it was nice. When we had air raids, the boat went out into the sea. Boy, did I get seasick, plus the bombs all around. It got too bad after a while and we worked on land. We would hear the boat's last message in code. We got hit, we are sinking. God bless Germany and our families. Then it was all over and we could not help them. I was stationed on the North Sea, and soon the English came and took the town. We, we became prisoners of war and were put in camps. It was not too bad. We had to clean the officer's room, and they gave us a little food. One day, they said, okay, you can go home. You are now on your own. Everything in the country was torn up by then from the war. There were no trains, no cars, nothing but our two legs would get us home. Eight girls we were started walking. I had to go from the north to the south across country. We walked on days and at night people had to sleep in their barns or homes. It took us a long time to get home. One day I walked down the street at home and dad came up the street to go to work. He saw me and he fell down and thanked God. Oh how happy we were. He did not go to work that day at all. They had not known if I was dead or alive. We could not get any mail to any place. We all were very happy again and everyone worked hard and soon all those things seemed like a bad dream. That is my childhood from age one to 21. Without God in our lives, we could never have made it through the war. Now Ann comes back with her life after the war and her move to the United States in Germany. Anne Wolf. Okay, you remember who all was here. Um, 
when I joined the Navy as a teenager, I had a choice. I worked for a doctor, and he had to go into service, and then I joined the Navy, and I got put in a prisoner of war camp. And then finally, the English took over the town up there, and they let us off. And they say, well, the best way you can go home, go home. And there was nothing else but to walk home. So I was up in the North Sea, and I lived down in Bavaria on the south end of the country. So I had to walk from up there. About six girls of us, we walked. And uh, when I came home, then I walked through my hometown, and here comes my dad. He was on his way to work. And uh, when I met, when Dad and I met on the street, from my way home from the prison of war camp, we went uh, home. Dad was so happy I was alive. He said, I'm not going to work today. We had no mail from each other for months, and I did not know if they were okay or not. Dad told me to wait outside the door to surprise Mom. He went in, and Mom said, Dad, are you sick? You come back home. And Dad said, Lord, no. I never felt better in all my life. <laughs> and um, I got something for you outside. And Mom came out and saw me, and oh, she was so happy, and told Dad, see, I told you my prayer will be answered. And when my sister came home from, from school, we all made a very happy day. I think I went to sleep and slept for two days. Then one day, Mom said, I want to tell you about Dad. We almost lost him, but the good Lord saw to it, so he is okay. Just about three days before the Americans took over the town, the SS came and got all the men that was left in town together and told them they had to go out and fight for the town to keep it away from the Americans. My dad never did have to go into the army because his company had uh, put him back. They needed him too bad for work. So Dad and all the other 12 men went to the schoolyard to get their uniforms and guns. In the schoolyard, they had a brick wall around the yard, and it had a hole close to the bottom on the ground. We used to crawl through them when I went to school there. Dad knew about it, and when all the men went in line to get their things, Dad went through that hole and went home. He told Mom, I am not going to kill anybody and it's useless to go out there and fight. Mom said they knew if the SS miss him, they come and kill him. So Mom and Dad went down to the basement, and Mom shuffled all the coals to one side and laid Dad down on the, on the floor, and then she shuffled all the coal back and buried him in it. Then she went back up and saw the SS car driving up by the door. She said she fell on her knees and prayed to God that they would not find him. The SS went all through the house from the top to the basement. One of the SS took his bayonet all through the coals, and Dad said he felt it a few times, but he didn't say a word. Then they left. They came every two hours and searched the house, and Dad laid under them coals for three days with no food, and Mom couldn't get anything to him. Mom said, then the American soldiers came and checked the house after they took over the town. And Mom said, I was so happy to see them and that the SS was gone. She did ask an American to help her to get Dad out from under the coals, and they did, even so they could not understand what she was talking about. If the SS would have found Dad, they would have killed everybody in our family. Dad told me, to go on back to school. He knew soon they would change all the German money, because Hitler was on it, into a different money. It was soon, we get one mark for 10 old marks in new money, and everybody lost a lot. But all the people worked hard and made good again. After a few months, the doctor's wife came and wanted me to go back to work for him. By that time, the newspapers told all about what happened to all the Jews who disappeared during the war. It was all kept a secret from the people until it was discovered after the war. They had them go into bath in the hundreds together, and while they were bathing, they turned on the gas and all died. They took the children from their mothers and killed them while the mothers had to watch, and then shot the fathers. It was just horrible. Some just starved to death. We could hardly believe what had happened. Then they had the trials in Nuremberg, 
and a lot of the Nazi leaders killed themselves in their cells. I went back to work for the doctor and had to take care, he had to take care of the American soldiers twice a week. We still had to be off the street, we had curfew, by 8 p.m. or the MP would pick you up. One night I got off from work and when I came to the railroad crossing, a long freight train came and I had to wait. I had about six minutes to get home. I got to the home, I was right in front of the house and looked for my key, here comes the MP and picked me up and I had to spend the night in jail. Mom looking out the window but she couldn't help me. But she came in in the morning and bailed me out. Then one day, one of the American soldiers by the name of Von Vau came to the office with a bad cold. I checked his blood pressure, his pulse, and I checked his weight, but the doctor ordered the shot and I gave it to him. And he was a very sick boy. I guess he kind of liked it because he came back for more. Then he came with his leg broken. We fixed him up by sending him to the hospital. We needed some insurance paper signed, so I went to see him, but he thought I came to visit him, and he was very pleased. A few months later, he came again, but we could not find a thing wrong with him this time, but the doctor said, you know, I think he's in love, and I think it's you. I said, oh, no, you're wrong. He's just lonely. Then he waited one night when I got off from work. I told him that the people cut off the girl's hair when they see him going with American soldiers, and I just didn't like to walk around bald. But he came again, and I asked my parents what to do about it. And uh, since we could stay out longer then, they'd say, well, maybe he is lonesome. Ask him if he would like to come up and meet the family, you know. And he came to the house. No one could hardly understand what the other one said. But on this day, but then on his day off, he took my sisters, which was 10 years old, into the park. So mom had some free time when she was not in school. One day he said, I think I'd like to marry you. But I said, no way, I never go away from home. But we did put in to get married. Every day for a year, I had to get some kind of information for the FBI from my great, great, great grandmother and grandfather up to my little sister. They had to know everything. I was ready to give up. I had forgotten all about being in jail for one night, but they knew it. They told me right about it. And Ron said, let's go and get married by the Germans <coughs> until they get through with the investigation. We did. On May 17, 1949, we went. The preacher asked Vaughn the question, but Vaughn, he didn't understand German, so we just stood there. And I said, now, do you or don't you? <laughs> so he finally said, oh, yes, I do. In, in 1959, in 1951, his time was up in the Army, and he had to come home to the States to get his discharge. I could not come because my papers were not in order yet. One said he would be back. In 1952, I lost our baby, and in April 1952, he came back over. Then they said, since he is out of the Army now, you do not need all that red tape. You just go ahead and get married. So we just renewed our four years' marriage on the same day again. In December 1952, we said, well, we better go home to America. We got on the train to go to Paris, France, and then to Le Havre to catch the Aldi France liner to America. On the border from Germany to France, they checked our passports. Mine was okay, but old Vaughn forgot to check out in my hometown. And we had to get off the train, be put in jail all night, and they had to call home and see until they found out his passport was okay. It took us all night to find out. In the morning, we had to go in a taxi to Paris and catch our train that next morning. Then we got on the boat. Boy, did I get seasick. The sea was rough. The boat was a big hotel. Everything was there. But I wished it had been on land. <laughs> I got seasick, and every time I looked up here, were those great big whales falling behind the boat for food. I told myself in 10 days I'd be dead by this. But I found out they had a movie on the boat, and it was running all day long. They had different movies, every different country movies. 
I couldn't understand half of it, but that's where I spend all my time. I just sit there in the morning until night, till the movies were over. And uh, Vaughn came and brought me some food. And I watched him anyway. And we came to, you know, to New York then on December 28, 1952, and took the train home to Mississippi. My mother-in-law was very good to me. I could not speak too much English, but I told myself, if I have to live here, I just got to get with it. Every year on January 1st, I had to report to the immigration office because I was an immigrant from another country. But they said, after five years, I can file for U.S. citizenship. We came to East Peoria in 1954, and Vaughn worked at Caterpillar about three months. He got laid off, and we lived in St. Louis. In 1956, we came back to East Peoria and even back to Caterpillar. And they had all the men called back. One day I went to file for my citizenship, even I had not been here for five years yet. I done just fine, but the first word he gave me to write down, I misspelled it. And I done it over again and I told him, I'm sorry, I, I spelled it wrong. But he said, okay, you can have it anyway. So 1956, I became an American citizen and I never had to report to the immigration office again. In uh, Germany, we all belonged to the St. Miguel Church, a great big church. It had a floor all the way up to the roof and had pipes going, you know, up and down. They had to pump it from the second floor up to the roof. I miss going to church over here. In our church, I was taught from the Bible translation by Martin Luther. Then I was asked to come to Elmridge Church to hear a great man preach. It was the Reverend Mr. Worley Barnhill. I was a backslider, got away from the church, but on May the 6th, 1962, I was born again into Elmridge Baptist Church. And on Mother's Day, May 13, 1962, I was baptized into the fellowship in Elmridge Baptist Church. I was a, it, was a good and wonderful feeling to be, belong to God again. I am proud to be a Baptist and to live in the great country called the United States of America. May God bless her always, this church and my, all the members and my parents. <laughs>